This is the Extra Point Podcast. During this podcast, we will dive deeper into our Sunday teaching and share practical next steps for your faith journey. Now, let's kick off the Extra Point. Hey, welcome to the Extra Point. I'm Cheryl Ross, the Next Steps and Discipleship Pastor here at Southward Church, and I'm with Scott Beha, our lead pastor. And we are in our series Fight Song, where we've just been going through, um, we're in week two, so we've hit a couple psalms and how to really just read um, psalms and scripture and um, take what we need from it for our, for our lives. And so I just want, before, if we, before we go any further, if I can talk, um, make sure that you like and subscribe this channel so that way you don't miss out on any new content. Um, but this week you were in Psalm 51, and we talked a lot about um, sin and repentance. So um, you shared with us this, this you know, the true definition of sin and consequence yeah. of sin. And so let's just dive into that a little bit more, because I think it's very enlightening and helpful yeah. for us to have that understanding to then move forward in our lives. Yeah, so I, I share that, like, I think most people's view of sin is is actually not a very biblical view of sin. Mm -hmm. And I said this was my understanding growing up, too. And well, I want to be really, really clear. I'm not saying that anyone ever taught, taught me this. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone's ever taught this. Mm -hmm. I just think that when they talk about sin, they're just not very clear on it. And this mm -hmm. becomes the assumption about sin, whereas my view of, of sin based on how I read the scriptures, I think ties it to something more concrete that I mm -hmm. think there's like a light bulb that goes off in our head that goes like, this is big. And so this is why the definition of sin is so big. Because I, I always grew up, again, not being taught, but just assuming that sin was um, the, the inability to follow arbitrary rules. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm thinking that God is just going, getting drunk is wrong. Mm -hmm. having sex outside of marriage is wrong, lying is wrong, and then he's just choosing mm -hmm. that behavior um, over the opposites of those. Because, yeah, okay, it does make sense that those are definitely better options, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm not, like, I don't, I don't think there's, there's any, like, argument to be made that, like, not right. lying is definitely superior morally to lying. Yeah. But, Truth be told, that's actually not really, I don't think, that's not really what the Bible is talking about when it comes mm -hmm. to sin. Because the word that, that we have translated sin, hamartia, is about missing the mark. Mm -hmm. It's a, like some people will tie it to like archery. They'll say that like in, in old archery competitions, mm -hmm. they would try to shoot the arrow, people would stand next to it. If they miss, they'd say sin. Yeah. Um, I, honestly, I've heard people challenge whether that's actually like factually true or not, but either way, the, the idea is to that that it misses the mark. Mm -hmm. But then the, the, the our question all along should have been, what's the mark, mm -hmm. right? Because if the mark is just we're just we are just trying to adhere to the rules as God sets them. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's I guess that's one way that you could look at it, but I don't think that's a strong way of looking at it. Right. Rather, what the mark that you're missing has to be tied to your original purpose in the first place. Mm -hmm. Which, like, again, if you just see sin as not following certain rules, and you're, you know, as a kid growing up, I'm going, I don't understand. Well, how does God feel this way about this and feel this way about this and on and on and on and on? Mm -hmm. At some point, I'm not saying that it is arbitrary. I'm just saying it seems somewhat arbitrary on the human side of it. Whereas if it's tied to our original purpose, mm -hmm. then all of it makes more sense to me. So when God created humanity, he gives them their original vocation to be the image bearers of God. We're mm -hmm. supposed to go and show creation what God is like. Mm -hmm. That's the sin. Being genu like What it means to be a genuine human is to reflect perfectly the image of God to the created order. Mm -hmm. That's the mark. Mm -hmm. So so when we say sin is missing the mark, it's it, it's your inability to to uh, live in a genuinely human way. 
-hmm. meaning to not live out the image of God within you. And so all of a sudden, now, like, lying is not just morally superior to not lying Mm -hmm. and, and telling the truth. Now, all of a sudden, we realize that lying goes against the way that God created us mm-hmm. in our very Im- his image in us we are made in the image of a truthful God mm-hmm. so therefore when we lie we miss the mark of genuine humanness because we have told something false mm-hmm. why is murder a sin mm-hmm. because God is a life-giving God this is something that takes life why mm-hmm. is being unkind um, to someone why is that sin like mm-hmm. like why does that matter Mm-hmm. Well, because we're made in the image of a good and kind God. Like, can you go on and on and on and on down mm-hmm. what 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 we believe sin is, and you'll realize it's all tied to the image of God within us. Mm-hmm. So, therefore, that is a much stronger way to talk to, especially like to talk to kids. Yeah. About sin, because if you don't if you don't be very clear with kids, they'll grow up thinking that that this whole thing of following Jesus is all just about following rules. Mm-hmm. This is why so many people end up with such a weird version of Christianity or a weird view of Christianity is because they just read the Bible in little segments that they can, rather than seeing as a comprehensive whole. Mm-hmm. Right? So we're not interpreting what we believe sin to be in light of Genesis one twenty six, which is where it should. That's where you should start. Mm-hmm. Hey, why was humanity created in the first place? Mm-hmm. Because you have to answer that question before you have a mark to try to actually hit. Yeah. And so, so many people get these, like, weird, like, legalistic views, Mm -hmm. and they go, like, oh, well, you're not supposed to dance, right? Well, wow, dancing is a sin. Well, where'd you come up with that from? Yeah. Because you think God's arbitrary because that's your view of sin. Yeah. No, God's not arbitrary. God calls sin whatever is opposite of his nature. Mm-hmm. So is dancing the opposite of his nature? No. Mm-hmm. So now you've just done something goofy. Yeah. and tried, this, is, this is how we've got these goofy versions of Christianity yeah. is because we have thought God is just flipping a coin going, well, this is better than this. Mm-hmm. Not dancing is better than dancing. Mm-hmm. Like whatever it is, like just insert your, your issue there. Mm-hmm. And so when you get it away from that, then, you, uh, then, then what happens is for kids it just feels like, Mm, yeah, that doesn't like you're you're trying to get me to adhere to a set of rules mm-hmm. when really I think if you'll tie it to their overall purpose, hey, yes. listen, God designed you mm-hmm. in such a way to do this. Mm-hmm. When you do this, you're not living out your God given purpose. Yeah, that is so much more powerful than yeah. wagging your finger in someone's face and saying, "I'm sorry yeah. that you don't have it, you know, together enough to follow these rules." Mm-hmm. It's just not a strong way to teach. Yeah, I think it about gives faith. It gives not just the the fact of it, but like it gives the why behind it. Like exactly, I think for a kid's mind, knowing that why behind it, because um, that's something like with with my son Carter, who's seven, like that we kind of try to dig at all the time. That because he can answer some of the questions, but he doesn't understand the why. Yeah, and so like we're trying to dig deeper into that to help him understand. The why behind it. Why do you need a savior? Why yeah. do, like, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Why, you know, understanding the why behind it. Yeah. So that way it's, it, he has a better understanding, a better, you know, foundation going yeah. forward where it's not just something he comes and he, like, he believes in God. Like he yeah. totally, absolutely does, but he doesn't understand the whole, like, foundation of it. Yeah. And so I don't want him to go from, you know, an elementary kid having these ideas and then, in middle school, something opens up and it's like, wait, was I ever really saved? Like, I don't, yeah. I don't want that kind of thing. Um, I think he'll have a different understanding as a middle schooler than what he does as an elementary kid. But I think them helping them understand those whys and like the fullness of it, I think yeah. sets them up better. Yeah. This is the other, like we say it in church quite often that we're not just saved from certain things. Mm-hmm. We're saved for certain things. Yeah. Right? So when you tie your definition of sin to the original human vocation of being an image mm-hmm. bearer, then all of a sudden you realize what you've been saved for yeah. is it motivates you towards mm-hmm. a different life. Mm-hmm. Whereas like most people, their experience of salvation just led them away from whatever rules they were breaking. Yeah. Right? Oh, I stopped drinking. Mm-hmm. I stopped cussing. Stopped chewing. Stopped listening to yeah. that music. Stop, yeah, stopped listening to certain types of music. <laughs> And all this, yeah. 
but it didn't like never motivate them mm-hmm. towards, hey, but yeah. listen, you're made in the image of a truthful, mm-hmm. good, kind, mm-hmm. honest, loving mm-hmm. God. That's who you're supposed to be. Yeah. You're not just supposed to not do these things. You're supposed to be these things. Yeah. I'll never forget the first time I read, actually the first and only time, this is probably probably time to revisit this, that I read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Mm-hmm. There was a part that I've always like, went back and thought over and over and over and go like, I don't, maybe he's just operating at a different level than me mm-hmm. or maybe because he's British, I just don't understand certain things. But he would talk about how cowardice is a sin. Mm-hmm. Being, being a coward is a sin. Not being courageous is a sin. I would be like, what? Yeah. What? Why is being a coward a sin? Like it's not, clearly it's not a, like something that you want to strive for. But like for right. me, it was like, well, what rule is he breaking by being a coward? Yeah. Again, that's the wrong question. That's why I didn't understand mm-hmm. what he was talking about. It's because you're made in the image of a God who is anything but a coward. Mm-hmm. So you're missing the mark. So we get to a more human view of sin mm-hmm. and how God feels about it when we understand that it's tied to the original human vocation yeah. of Genesis 1 and 2. Yeah. This gives us a foundation to talk to our kids properly about sin. Mm -hmm. This gives you a foundation to talk to your teenagers properly about about sin. So the way it it doesn't just seem like some sort of coincidence that the church agrees with all of your parenting tactics. Yeah. Right? This, like, like actually Mm -hmm. ties in. Like, hey, the Bible, okay, let's, if we want to go, like, why should you not get drunk? Mm -hmm. You're made in the image of a God who is fully in control. Yeah. Who is the the epitome of self control? Yeah, self contained power. Mm-hmm. That that's why, like, yeah. you, like, and again, then the church gets goofy and goes like, "Oh, God is um, against all alcohol." Like, yeah. no, it's like, well, you can't make that point from scripture whatsoever. Yeah, and teenagers will poke holes in that. Yeah, I did it absolutely. my whole teenage year. But when you go, but here's why you shouldn't do this mm-hmm. it's because you're no longer in control mm-hmm. and you're made in the image of a god who is in control yeah. that's why that, that's why that is a that's so much and like we have a we have a question on the table right now in our culture like what christians are supposed to do with weed because mm-hmm. it we used to have a really easy answer it's, it's illegal yeah. so you can't break the laws of right. Christian, right um but now it's like well now that it's being legalized how do we go after this yeah. topic and i go well well it's pretty simple we're made in the image of a god who is in control mm-hmm to to succumb to 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 that would be to lose control. Mm-hmm. Trust me, I've been there, done that. Like people that talk about, oh, I'll just be smoking a little weed to calm my nerves. No, listen, you're you're not fully in control mm-hmm. when you're there. That's why. So again, the church has to do a better job of talking about sin and mm-hmm. tying it to purpose, yeah, and the original purpose. And then what you'll see is that. People no longer have such a visceral reaction mm-hmm. to um, to the topic of sin. You mm-hmm. don't have to skirt around it anymore because you can go like, you, you can take it right to, well, this is why that it's not arbitrary. I think one of the reasons why so many people have such an issue with the stances that Christians take on certain things is because they think that it's arbitrary. Mm-hmm. And that's probably because they were never taught that it's not. Right. So we take that away from mm-hmm. them and go, this is all based on the original design yeah. of humanity. And I'm not saying that there's not some flaws that right. happen as the result of the, the innate sinful nature because of yeah. our sin yeah. in that. But you have to tie it back to the beginning. Yeah. Because then what you'll find from beginning to the end is you start weaving a story that actually makes sense yeah. rather than one that just feels compartmentalized yeah. and feels very convenient. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I think what's so cool that I've been thinking about this whole time that you've been talking is that, you know, part of Jesus coming and ascending, like he gave us the Holy Spirit. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, you're given the Holy Spirit. And it says, like, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Like, and it says that you're given, you know, you're given everything you need to live a godly life, like, through the Holy Spirit. And so, like... Once you become someone who is a believer in Jesus Christ, who's living that way, like he gives you what you need to help fight against that. And that's part of that. Like you're not just saved from something, you're saved to something. And he 
gives you what you need to do, the thing that he's asking you to do. Jesus of Nazareth was the only genuinely human Mm -hmm. to never mar the image of God. That's why when we say that he is sinless, it's that he, without any failure, showed us what God was Mm -hmm. like. That's what Jesus of Nazareth did. It was not that Jesus of Nazareth adhered to certain rules. It's that he, this is what Hebrews 1 says, that he is the very imprint of the invisible God made manifest to us. Mm -hmm. And so, like, what Jesus did was go, go, hey, listen, this is how it's done. Yeah. This, you were supposed to be this type of human. I'm showing you what it looks like to be genuinely human. And, and he, he was the perfect image mm-hmm. of God that both embodied truth and grace. Mm-hmm. And again, that's a tension. John 1, 14, yeah. that's the tension right there. Truth yeah. and grace. Mm-hmm. And we go like, why do so many Christians mar the image of God to the world around them? It's because they're, they're, they're missing that right there. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let's talk a little bit about the consequence of sin. Yeah. Um, because... A lot of times, like, I know that I was taught this, like, hey, the consequence of sin is death. Like, yeah. and and then when you're teaching that to little kids, it can be like, oh, my gosh. So if I lie, am I going to die instantly? Like, especially yeah. if you look at some of the stories. So let's talk a little bit about what the true consequence of yep. sin is in our lives. Yeah, I, I know what God said. He told Adam and Eve, if you eat of the tree, then you're going to die. Mm-hmm. But that... If we want to say that the consequence of sin is like death, you really need to qualify it Mm -hmm. because Adam and Eve did not immediately die. Right. Now, ultimately, it introduced um, that consequence to them, Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't the immediate issue. Because Mm -hmm. now, if if we want to press this, like, yes, I know Romans for the wages of sin is Mm -hmm. death. Absolutely. Listen. You want to press this idea of separation far enough, you mm-hmm. do get to the second death, the final separation of you yeah. from God, yeah. where you will be, you will exist in some sort of realm that is mm-hmm. apart from his goodness, um, that mm-hmm. is apart from his grace, that is apart from any common grace whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, that death is definitely coming. Mm-hmm. But what we see in Genesis, what we see throughout all the scriptures, mm-hmm. is that the first thing that happens before that is separation. Mm-hmm. God says, if you eat of the tree, then you'll surely die. But then he just sends them away from his presence. Mm-hmm. And then when Cain, um, when Cain sins in Genesis 4, he sends them even further away from his presence. Yeah. When humanity is evil mm-hmm. in Genesis chapter 6 and 7 and 8, there's another consequence, mm-hmm. right? It's it's further exile, mm-hmm. right? This time it comes in exile in the form of flood, mm-hmm. in the form of death. Absolutely. Yeah. You get to Genesis chapter 11. You get the Tower of Babel. Mm-hmm. These people were getting mixed up with the people around them mm-hmm. and thinking that God was a different type of God than what he was. And so they build this tower, um, because they think that they're going to meet God's needs. Mm-hmm. What was the, the consequence of Genesis 11? We all think, oh, Genesis 11 is how we got world languages. No. What happens in Genesis 11 is God sends the people mm-hmm. out even further. Yeah. You see, it's like these concentric mm-hmm. circles yeah. of exile. And then yeah. Israel comes along. Their consequence is exile. Mm-hmm. When the northern kingdom couldn't get their crap together, exile. When the southern kingdom couldn't get their crap together, exile. Mm-hmm. Over and over and over and over and over. Yeah. Those of us that are born sinful, we are born into exile. Mm-hmm. We are, and, and in exile, you're overtaken by a new master. This is what happens to, uh, to Israel mm-hmm. in, um, in Genesis. Um, in going into Exodus, they find themselves in slavery. Mm-hmm. They find themselves in, all through the book of Judges, which is what we're covering on the potluck, me and Jerry, recently. God, this is a form of exile when he lets your enemies overtake you. That's mm-hmm. creating that separation between where you and God were meant mm-hmm. to be. If you look at all the consequences in the scriptures, they all, they all f- circle around this one idea of exile, death, 
separation. Mm -hmm. These are all one and the same as far as the Bible is concerned. Mm -hmm. When you're separated, it's a form of exile. This is a form of slavery. This is ultimately a form of death. These are mm -hmm. all the same ideas as far as the consequences mm -hmm. of sin are concerned. The, the picture is you're removed from the blessed place that God had for you. That's always been the consequence of sin. And I didn't get to say it on Sunday, but I had it in my notes. Yes, you keep playing this out over and over and over and over and over and over. Eventually, you do get to the end of your life to where you do experience the ultimate exile yeah. in hell. Yeah. Like, and, and I'm, you know, I, I still believe that there's a very real place called hell. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that we've always taught biblically what that means. Right. But I believe hell is the absence of the presence yeah. of God, which from what I can tell has always been the consequence is for unrepentant sins, yeah. is distance from God. That just ends up being the ultimate distance from God. Mm -hmm. And so on the micro level, though, this, this is how this happens in our life. When you and I have sin in our life, it has created distance from God. Mm -hmm. And it was not God that moved. It was us that moved mm -hmm. in that. God hasn't yeah. moved. God, like uh, Again, sometimes we sin and we think, well, oh, gosh, yeah. God has seemed so far away from me. And it's like yeah. what you didn't realize was that it wasn't that God moved. It was that you were moving every choice that you made. Mm -hmm. Every time that you decided to do things your way, every time that you yeah. decided to take matters into your own hand, you were moving further and further mm -hmm. away from him. It wasn't him moving away from yeah. you. It wasn't him going, oh, I can't stand this. I can't. You're awful, nasty, you're horrible. Mm -hmm. I want it away from you. It was you taking steps further and further away, all the while trying to figure out, why does God feel so distant from me? And it's because what happened was your sin filled that gap that pushed you further and further outside of that blessed place that God had for you. Mm -hmm. And that happened to Adam and Eve, it happened to Cain, it happened to the people um, of Babel, and it happened to Israel over and over mm -hmm. and over. And it happens to all of us in our lives. That, that sin creates so much space between us and God yeah. that I think most people um, in that situation find it easier to just give up rather than repent and try to get back to where they were. Yeah. No, I think that's good. So now that we kind of have an understanding about um, the consequence of sin, how it separates us, let's talk about how we take care of that separation through repentance. Yeah, so... The, what David models for us in Psalm 51 is that the way that we get back close to God is through repenting of what we did. And this is a painful process for, for, for many of us, and so a lot of us, we don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. Because it means that we need to come clean, right? It means that, we, like, first and foremost, like David says in verse 4, I sinned against you and you mm -hmm. alone, God. Mm -hmm. I sinned against you and you alone. So you got to make things right with God. Yeah. But at the, the on the other side of it, you have to make things right with other people that you've hurt as well. Yeah. That's what true repentance requires. And this is a very hard process for most people. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And so repentance is you actually agreeing with God mm -hmm. that what you did was a sin. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I mean, I'm certain that, that you've, like, encountered people or know people that they've done they've sinned mm -hmm. but yet they they would claim well i didn't do anything mm -hmm. or it's not that big of a deal or well everybody does that yeah and it's like the fact that everyone does that is not a very good reason for for you to continue to live in that sort of mm -hmm. sin whatsoever or well this is just the way that i am that's not really a good excuse right like no, none of us would go like oh that's just the way that we are that's just you know no, we would say change is always possible. Transformation is always the best mm -hmm. option if that's the case. Mm -hmm. And so repentance is you agreeing with God that what you did was sin, yeah. coming clean about it. But it's like in verse 2, David asked to be washed clean. He doesn't yeah. want to be forgiven so the way he can go back to sin. Right. He wants to be forgiven mm -hmm. so he can remove um, the distance between mm -hmm. him and God, and he does not intend to create more distance. Mm -hmm. That's what these, these people that like... You, you you like you every every Sunday you repent and then you just go do whatever you want all week long then you mm -hmm. get repent again and like I guess that's better than not doing anything but like that's not God's not really washing you clean the way you can just get dirty again mm -hmm. that's that's a ridiculous like mindset to have yeah. when it like because again most of us we don't take our sin nearly s serious mm -hmm. enough right we think like 
oh, it's not that big of a deal. You know, Jesus died to pay the price for my sins, so what, what's the big deal? I'm forgiven uh-huh. of all this, so yada, yada, yada. And, like, yeah. it's like, well, let me just ask if you, how big of a deal you would think it is if someone that you loved punched you in the face every day? Yeah. Like, would you, how, how, would the, how would you like that? And would you, let, let's say for a month straight, your child punched you in the face. A month straight. And I mean, like, grown child punched you square yeah. in the nose every single day. At the end, like, but every Sunday, for one hour, they go, I love you. <laughs> and then on Monday, they punch you in the face. And on Tuesday, they punch you in the face. They do this for a whole month. Mm-hmm. I'm going to guess at the end of that month, the next time they go, but I still love you, you're going to go, I'm not really mm-hmm. sure that you do. Yeah. I'm not. Like, if your best friend punched you in the face for a year straight and went, mm-hmm. but I love you, you go, I don't think that you really do. Mm-hmm. At some point, if you really love me, and again, I'm not teaching that Christians are sinless, that Christians are perfect. Right. I'm saying at some point, you're going to have to realize that you're hurting the one that you say that you love, and if you mm-hmm. continue to hurt them, then you don't love them. Mm-hmm. That's just the, that's the facts of the matter. Yeah. Um, so you have to agree with that it's sin. You got to change your mind. Ask them to wash you clean, and 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 to repent literally means to turn and go the d- a different direction. Mm-hmm. So, so so like if you come to church, let's say that you're living with someone that you're not married to, you're sleeping with them, you feel mm-hmm. guilty, you repent of it. To to go back home and to mm-hmm. enter back into that for another yeah. six months. Yeah. I. If you get a plan together to get out of that, I'll, yeah. I'll believe that your repentance is sincere. Yeah. But if you don't have no plan, right. you just go right back to it. I'm not buying that, not for a second. Right. Right. If you if you say, oh, I'm sorry for lying, and then the minute you walk out of church, you lie again, you were not sorry. Right. Whatsoever. Like, yeah. you can't, like, David wants wiped clean so the way he, it won't keep happening. He wants to be made new. Mm-hmm. That's the desire. Like, again, yeah. you're not going to be perfect at it. It's probably going to be a process, yeah. but at some point, you have to really evaluate your life and go, like, am I act, like, am I just trying to abuse the grace of God? Mm-hmm. And, and, and this is where, like, as a pastor, it always feels like you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, Mark, I don't, I don't care how people feel about Mark Driscoll. He, he's brilliant whether or not he's mm-hmm. a disaster in other areas, <laughs> but, like, he, he teaches, he's like, so many people are afraid to talk about the grace of God because mm-hmm. they're afraid that people will abuse the grace of God. Mm-hmm. But the, the truth is you can't stop people from abusing the grace of God. Right. You still have to teach it because some people need to use the grace yeah. of God. Like some people do need it. Yeah. Like I need Absolutely. the grace of God yeah. when I fall short. So I can't be afraid of talking about the grace of God mm-hmm. just because, yes, there will be people in my congregation that will take that and abuse it mm-hmm. and will end up separated from God for all eternity. But there are genuine seekers that, like, they just, they're just they just not there yet. I'm, yeah. I'm just not there yet that need to use yeah. the grace of God to go, yeah. all right, I, I, I messed up again, I fell again. So that's why it always feels like this, like, double-edged sword every time I'm talking about yeah. this. Because on one, like, on one side it feels like I'm taking a really, like, hard conservative stance mm-hmm. that would, like, most people would be like, oh, I don't really like how he talks about sin and, and all this. On the other hand, I, 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 I hold in perfect tension um, that the grace of God is mm-hmm. so much deeper than you'll ever begin to understand. Mm-hmm. And so, like, there's always more grace in God than there will ever be sin in you. Yeah. And so, like, you have to hold those two things in tension. It's like that grace is there for when I fall. Yeah. But I can't presume upon it. Right. Like, Romans 6, Paul says, you know, since grace abound, like, Mm -hmm. should we continue in sin so that grace can abound? Like, should I keep sinning so I can show how gracious God is? And Paul's response is like, no, you absolutely should not. You should stop sinning. Yeah. Um. But you have to hold both of those two things mm-hmm. in tension. Like, nobody's perfect is mm-hmm. not a good excuse to continue to sin. Mm-hmm. Um, the grace of God is there for you. However, you're abusing it if you're not actually trying to seek to be different. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, like, in verse 7 where it talks about purify me from my sins. Yeah. I love that word because I think. Like whenever you're working with metals or anything like that, when you're trying to purify a metal, it's a process. Like the first time in the fire doesn't necessarily get out all the all the things that are um, keeping it from being fully 
um, that metal. Like it yeah. takes, there's a process. And so I think that's part of the, the thing is that he's, when he says purify me, yeah. like he wants it out for good. Like, yep. um, and so I think just remembering that, that there, there, there are those two points of it. Um, but remembering that, you know, if you're not, I think what you said on Sunday is, um, you know, people settling for religion instead of repentance, yeah. um, they settle for that. Hey, I'm going to come in. I'm going to give my hour. I'm going to, you know, say whatever I'm going to do the things and the motions and the yeah. stuff that looks good. Um, but I'm not truly going to turn away from that because you said it on Sunday. I don't hate this enough. Yeah. I don't hate my sin enough. I don't hate, um, you know, looking at that enough yep. to, to, to change. It takes that like total mindset shift, like kind of what you were talking about last week with the mindset change. Like it takes something different for you to realize that, that what you could have on the other side of that is so much better than what you have for a little moment. Yep. Like the times that, I was not living right and I was living far from God. Those moments that I maybe felt like, you know, oh, moments of, of peace, but it wasn't actual true peace. It was fake um, because I'd have, you know, I'd, I'd get drunk and I would forget all my problems, all my abuse, all my whatever. But as soon as I was sober again, all that came back. Yeah. Like it didn't go away. It didn't really fully help me. The only thing that truly helped me was truly working through those things. Yeah. And, and I think so often, like we trade in truly like the true goodness that we can have in life for those moments yeah. of, of what we think is good, but it's not really good for us. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I, the, the thing that bothers me the most in the church is the amount of people that will just settle for religion mm -hmm. rather than true transformation. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's the people in the scriptures that, that you see those people in the scriptures, we call them Pharisees. Mm -hmm. They were not interested in actually allowing God to ever transform them to be mm -hmm. kinder, more gentle, more loving type people. Yeah. They were all, they were just, again, just tell me what I have to do. Yeah. Just tell me what I have to do. I can follow that perfectly. Mm -hmm. Well, within that is there, there's no love for God in, yeah. in a religious ritual. Mm -hmm. Like until you, like the love has to come first, and then once yeah. the love comes first, then all of this other stuff gains meaning. Yeah. Again, like you can go take communion, um, but if, like, if your heart's not right with the God, like that's not going to do anything. Right. Like it's 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 just it's emotion. Nothing. Yeah. It's, like, it's you're just going through it. You come yeah. to church, but yet you don't let it actually affect you mm -hmm. and change you. You you didn't do anything. You might as well slept an extra hour on yeah. Sunday. Like, it's just. I don't know, like, again, I think it's completely the fault of the church, mm -hmm. like, in just in general, because people don't talk mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. So many people are just so concerned with, like, posting their stats out on mm -hmm. social media. Oh, we got eight people saved today. We got yeah. 35 baptisms. Like, but that's great if yeah. those are sincere, true. Like, if you're talking about the amount of people that raise their hand at the end of a service and not one next step was ever taken, don't, yeah. like, I don't give, like, I, I'm not buying that. Yeah. I'm not buying that because yeah. there's so many people that are just like, hey, we just we just got, got, get them to get them to say the sinner's prayer. Or get them to say the sinner's prayer. And it's like the sinner's prayer is freaking useless if their heart actually doesn't yeah. beat for Jesus. It's useless. Yeah. They didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Like they might as well be quoting Shakespeare. It doesn't yeah. like if their heart is not right. Because listen, a heart that is right mm -hmm. doesn't need the sinner's prayer. Right. A heart that is right. Yeah. Just a, 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 a sincere God help me mm -hmm. for a heart that's right is far superior to the sinner's prayer. Yeah. And and that's where, like, I have talked to volunteers, like, when I was leading kids ministry. And I would tell volunteers for a long time because it's that tension. Because, like, a, a child, they don't know why, like, why do I have to say a special prayer? Exactly. You know, they they understand it and get it at a level within them that they're like, no, I believe I'm cha like, why do I need to say these special words? And there's that yep. tension because of the scripture that says, if you, you know, confess with your mouth and you know, whatever. Yeah. And it's like, mm, but if you go back and you look like, I, I think it's, um, oh gosh, I'm going to have to sing the little song. The guy in the tree, Zacchaeus. Oh, yeah. Right. Whenever um, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus went to his house, like, he said salvation 
has come this day. Like, cause there yeah. was this heart change. Like he didn't like say some special prayer. Mm -hmm. It was the change in the transformation that took place within him that Jesus recognized, um, where he was taking action to actually do something different. He was making yeah. things right. And so I think that's, um, a really great point, but, um, I think that also, you know, when you stay in that place for so long, you lose your joy. Like for me, you know, I really didn't have any joy in those moments. Like those moments where I thought I was having fun or whatever. I really didn't have joy in that. And, and David says, you know, restore to me the, my joy. And he says the joy of my salvation. Like, um, I know we, we, we didn't want to debate it on Sunday, yeah. but let's talk a little bit about, um, about that and the whole like concept of eternal security or whatever. Yeah. Well, because I think that this is the doctrine that creates all of this tension mm -hmm. around. This is why well-meaning pastors can't preach this um, this way without having everyone in the room thinking that you're saying one thing while while maybe you're not mm -hmm. actually saying that. Um, because again, I have always felt like this. I don't think that the eternal security is something that the church needs to be concerned with. Mm -hmm. Um, I heard something recently last week that I've been chewing on. I haven't fully fleshed it out, so I hate like bringing a partial idea to something, but I'm I'm gonna do it anyways. But I was listening to this. This is a uh, messianic rabbi was talking. So he's a Jesus guy, but he's um, you know ethnically Jewish, um, and he was saying the the view of salvation and rescue in the scriptures. It's pretty clear that that is a um, that is something that God does at the end. Mm -hmm. Salvation and rescue is what God does at the end. Yeah. Um, because there were people that got set free and were on their way to the promised land. They, they had the proper trajectory, but they never got there. Mm -hmm. and, and you see that in the story of Israel. Mm -hmm. There were people on their way to the promised land, mm -hmm. yet because of their disobedience, did not get there. Mm-hmm. So what is that saying about the overall, uh, the overall mechanism of God saving someone? Mm -hmm. That sounds like the tr you might be on the right trajectory, but there's a reason why Paul urges over and over for you to finish the race. Mm -hmm. and this is where our eternal security folks, where I think it gets a little bit shaky for me, and this is why I can't fully endorse that doctrine is why why did they talk so much about finishing the race if you're telling me that mm -hmm. I, it doesn't matter how I finish yeah, the to, race? Yeah, to hold tight to the teaching, to why, do all those things. Like why, why did the people yeah. that got set free mm -hmm. and were on their way to the promised land not make it to the promised land because they were disobedience? Mm -hmm. If that story was meant to be a story to inform us about how God rescues and how God mm -hmm. saves, then my eternal security folks, we got some major questions to answer as to why those people did not end up in the promised land. Mm -hmm. Because I think when we receive Jesus, when we say yes to life with Jesus, mm -hmm. that sets the trajectory of our life. Mm -hmm. And if you finish in that trajectory, yes, God will save you. Mm -hmm. What if you don't finish in that trajectory? Yeah. And I know that we can sit here and play linguistic games and go like, or theological games. He goes, like, well, well, if they don't finish on that trajectory, then they never had it in the first place. And he goes, like, I don't know. That's hard. For, that's that's a hard mm -hmm. thing for for us to try to judge the heart of anyone is, is a very difficult mm -hmm. thing for us to do. Um, very difficult. Yeah. Not not to mention, like, why, why did all the disciples seem like they were on the right trajectory? Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, when something happens to Jesus, they're no longer on the right trajectory. Mm -hmm. Like, why does that, like, and the, but yes, I know they, they end up back on the right trajectory. But, like, why is there a break in that? Like, mm -hmm. there's, there's just all these questions when I look at it. I go, like, this is why I can't. And I think that it's that doctrine that leads to so many people settling for religion, settling for, well, I said the sinner's prayer, I raised my hand. Mm -hmm. type stuff rather than true transformation because the doctrine of, eter doctrine of eternal security doesn't require transformation. Yeah. Because it, it goes, oh, you, you, you said that you believe in Jesus. That's all that it takes. Yeah. Now, I know folks that believe that and believe that if you truly accept Jesus, you will be transformed. Yeah. But I think, again, there's people that teach that doctrine in such a dangerous way 
that they prop people up in their sin and never require them to repent. Yeah. And I go like, there's just no biblical way for you to look at someone who has built up such distance between mm-hmm. themselves and God because of their sin mm-hmm. to say that somehow God is going to step in and save them. Yeah. That is a hard, like, I think after listening to that rabbi last week, I probably feel a couple steps further away from that camp than what I used to feel. Because mm-hmm. th- th- that question of trajectory mm-hmm. and that some were on their way mm-hmm. but did not get there has really, like, kind of stuck with me. Like, yeah. what what was going on in that story, mm-hmm. right? And again, like Sol- like or, or King Solomon. Solomon was on the proper trajectory, then destroyed yeah. his life. Yeah, completely destroyed yeah. his life. Like, are we supposed to think that running half a race is actually finishing? Yeah, I just I, that to me seems like something that we really. And I know, I I know John six. I get it. Mm-hmm. Whoever the Father has given me, I haven't lost one of them, and such. I I. I, I get all the points that they make. I've got my own counterpoints for all of them. But I want to talk about trajectory. Can mm-hmm. we really say, like, so for, but for David. So for David, I would say, I mean, this guy didn't allow more distance. Right. That's why I know mm-hmm. that God saved him. Yeah. He didn't sin and then continue to sin and continue to sin to to the point where there was never yeah. And again, what you end up with in David's situation yeah. is here's where here's where these two camps, and this is the, the the silliness in the church. Here's where these two camps kind of diverge, and then where they come back together, where I think it's very sensible. And this is why I, I don't give a crap about this doctrine whatsatsoever. Yeah, I'm so, sorry. Sorry, it's just I showed up at a fellowship of Christian athletes one time whenever I was in uh, middle school, and it was all a bunch of uh, Baptist uh, folks. Mm-hmm. And the fir- not hey, what's your name? What church are you from? They sat me down to, to see if I was going to be able to be involved in their program. The first thing they asked me was, do you believe in eternal security? So, like, crap like that, like, makes me very irritated. Yeah. Um, in regards to this. Well, yeah. Now, now I forgot where I was headed. Um, where the two camps diverged. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So when it comes to David. Yeah. So David had a massive moral failure. Mm-hmm. What half the, the church will tell you is that David lost his salvation and then got saved again mm-hmm. when he repented in Psalm 51. Okay, the other half is going to go, no, he never lost it because he repented. What do we end up with? We end up with David being saved either way. Mm-hmm. So why does it matter? Yeah. You're sitting here trying to figure out what's going on in that little moment of his life. Yeah. That's not up to us. Yeah. That's not up to us. The doctrine of eternal security can only mm-hmm. be, um, like, it, it's going to be abused. Mm-hmm. Like, what what purpose do we have in telling people, yeah. hey, listen, yeah. once you're saved, you're always saved? What yeah. perp? Again, even if it's true, yeah. and I'm not saying that I'm like I've I have flip flop and flip flop and flip flop on this yeah. because it's such a non-issue for me. Mm-hmm. Even if it's true, why is that helpful? Yeah. Why is that helpful? Yeah, because I think when you see this, like restore me to the joy of your salvation, I just come back to that, like having more joy and understanding that what you have in Jesus is better and can bring you more joy, more peace, more everything than any of those other temptations that seem good in the moment. Like sleeping with her probably like there was a little pleasure in that for a moment, but like it didn't last. And so like my thought goes to, he's coming back to that moment of saying, no, this is better. Yeah. Life with you is better than what anybody in this world, anything in this world has to offer. And remembering yeah. that, like, bring me back to that mindset instead of this falling into this temptation as, it, as you know, someone who can do that or whatever. Like, bring me back to remembering that yeah. this is always going to bring me more. This is always going to have more. Like, that's where my mind goes to. So, like, even on Sunday when you said that, I was like, oh, I never even, when I'm reading this, I ne- my mind never went to that yeah. idea because I see it like as something totally different. But I, like, I agree. Like when you come back to it either way, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like it exactly. doesn't matter. They've you end up with fighting the same result. Over these little gaps of, and again, this is what I always tell people when they ask me about eternal security. I said, the only reason why eternal security ever even matters is for people that are interested in living lives of sin. Yeah. 
Because outside of that, it's a non-issue. Yeah, absolutely. If you are faithful to God every day of your life, it doesn't matter. The, mm-hmm. the answer to that question, we only yeah. ever talk about that question in regards to, yeah. well, is grandpa going to make it? Because he had a, a, you know, some pretty big bear, failures towards yeah. the end of his life. Well, yeah. I don't know if grandpa's going to make it because he did have some big failures in his life. And it's not And that's up not up to you. for me to judge, which yeah. is why we should stay as close to God as yeah. possible. Yeah. Again, all you could possibly do by telling people that they're mm-hmm. good no matter what is, is ex- make them feel is, like it's is okay. Make them to feel do. like, hey, I'm just going to go and do whatever. Yeah. That's the that's like because I get it. We want to comfort people. Mm-hmm. We want to ensure. Like, and this is why the Wesley and Arminians, why we believe in mm-hmm. um, the doctrine of assurance. Mm-hmm. That you can be sure mm-hmm. that you are saved yeah. based on the trajectory of your life. Yeah. I don't need some sort of doctrine that yeah. just props me up that's independent of the way that I'm right. living. Yeah. Yeah, because it's one of those, like, if you're not sure of it, then every time you do sin, you're going to feel like, oh, my gosh, if I die right this second, I'm going to go to hell. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? It's that understanding of, okay, I sinned. This was wrong. But I can come back. Yes, like I can turn away from it. Like I can, yeah. Not if you try to measure your life by a moment, mm-hmm. you're going to answer that question wrong. Yeah. It's about trajectory. Over the course of your life, mm-hmm. have you been getting closer and closer to God, mm-hmm. or are you taking steps yeah. deliberately away from Him? Yeah. And if you are taking steps deliberately away from Him, then why would you expect Him to save you? Yeah. Second question: Why would you want him to save you? Because right. you're the one that's been taking steps away. Yeah. It's it's Great a it, it's just for me, it's one of the most unhelpful conversations that mm-hmm. the church has been having for far too long. Yeah. And I think holiness is a much more mm-hmm. fruitful conversation and a much more fruitful mm-hmm. target to aim for. Yeah. Than um, than than eternal security. Yeah. So how do we make this part of our lives, part of our faith journey regularly? Yeah. It has to be part of your prayer life. I'll just keep it simple. It just mm-hmm. th- There's a reason why in the prayer that Jesus teaches to his disciples, mm-hmm. there's a part of it that says, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against you. Yeah. It's because part of your regular prayer should be your mm-hmm. admittance of your sin yeah. and you're, you're asking God, forgive me so that then I can go and live a life of forgiveness towards others. Mm -hmm. So it has to be part of your regular prayer life. Yeah, absolutely. Simple, easy. Um, Well, not always easy, but it's the the best way. Um, Your life will be a lot more fruitful in that way. Um, So, hey, we've got um, two more weeks of this series. We'll be back again next week with um, another discussion from another psalm. So we hope that you'll join us. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this um, so that way you don't miss out on any new content. And we'll be back again next week with some new um, practical next steps for your faith journey. Thanks for tuning in to The Extra Point. Be sure to subscribe to the Southridge Church Podcast and tune in every Wednesday for another episode of The Extra Point.